Okay, turn to um, 1 Samuel, back to 1 Samuel chapter 25. <clears throat> There's really a lot to read in this little story. Uh, we'll see how well we do. <clears throat> but we're reading stories out of the Old Testament in relationship to David because we're trying to find out <clears throat> what is being conveyed when people call Jesus the son of David in, in the New Testament. <clears throat> I mean, has anybody ever wondered about that? Thought, well, now why would that, you know, he's the son of God, or he's the son of Joseph, or whatever, but the son of David, you know. <clears throat> um, but it's because, uh, number one, it relates to the kingdom. And we're going to see this in just a little bit, uh, how Jesus' kingdom was pretty much the way David's was, because David was first and then Jesus, but David's kingdom was pretty much like Jesus because Jesus was before David, if you understand, using that scripture that we talked about <clears throat> in last class. All right, let's see, a verse, starting with verse 4. And David heard in the wilderness that Nabal did shear his sheep, and David sent out ten young men, and David said unto the young men, Get up to Carmel and go to Nabal, and greet him in my name. And Notice this, greet him in my name. And thus shall you say to him who liveth in prosperity, Peace be both to thee, and peace be to thine house, and peace be unto all that thou hast. And now I have heard that thou hast shearers, and now thy shepherds who were with us, we hurt them not, neither was there anything missing unto them. All the while they were in Carmel. Um, ask thy young men, and they will show thee. Wherefore, let the young men find favor in thine eyes, for we come in a good day. Give, I pray thee, whatsoever cometh to thine hand unto thy servants and to thy son David. And David's young men came and spoke to Nabal according to all these words in the name of David and ceased. And Nabal answered David's servants and said, Who is David and who is the son of Jesse? There are many servants nowadays who break away every man from his master. And so it goes on and on. But David <clears throat> is not ashamed. He's not uh, uh, afraid to ask for bread. He doesn't, he knows he's not a breakaway servant, a breakaway slave, a runaway slave. He knows that he's not that. <clears throat> he uh, is carrying himself like a king. So he says, he sends men before him like a king would and says, you know, can you help us out here? What would you be willing to give or whatever? And, uh, and he's... He is unashamed in that vein. <clears throat> but Nabal comes back with this, you know, which a whole lot of people in Israel were poisoned by Saul. And um, in fact, the majority probably were. And, and uh, he comes back with this, I, you know, I ain't giving him nothing. He doesn't, he's just a worthless guy, he's a runaway slave. He don't get nothing. Well, David, this time, and it's very rare, very rare, but this was one of the times that David got upset. Okay, and if you read the rest of the story, you'll see he, you know, my gosh, we've helped you. We did this. We covered your sheep shears. We kept this and that and all this stuff. And so now he's ready to come down and take the guy's head off. Okay? Um, well, all of a sudden, this girl named Abigail shows up, this woman named Abigail, and she's got all of this food and all this blessing and all this. And she says, you know, she bows down to the king and says, here, please, you know, take this, and this is for your men, and this is enough to da -da -da, take care of you for a while and all this stuff. And David is still upset. He's fuming. And... She basically, and let me see if I've even got the, those scriptures marked here. Maybe, maybe not. Verse 18. Yeah, here's, here's, here it is. Then Abigail made haste and took 200 
loaves and two skins, uh, two skins of wine and five sheep ready dressed, five measures of parched grain and a hundred clusters of raisins and two hundred cakes of figs and laid them on asses. And she said unto her servants, Go on before me, behold, I come after you. But she told not her husband Nabal. And it was so as she rode on the ass that she came back or she came down by the top of the mountains and behold David and his men came down toward her and she met them. So in other words, he's coming to wipe out Nabal and everything that he owns and she meets him on the way. Now David had said, surely in vain have I kept all that this fellow hath in the wilderness, so that nothing was missing of all that pertained unto him, and he hath requited me evil for good. Now that, that is an important factor. That's, why, that's one of the reasons why I think Nabal dies so quickly, but that's in my opinion, that's another thing. Verse 22, so, so, and more also do God unto the enemies of David, if I leave of all that pertain to him by the morning light any male. When Abigail saw David, she hastened and alighted from the ass and fell before David on her face and bowed to the ground and fell at his feet and said, <clears throat> Upon me, my Lord, upon me let this iniquity be. And let thine handmaiden, I pray thee, speak in thy hearing and hear the words of thy handmaiden. Let not, my Lord, I pray thee, regard this worthless fellow, even Nabal. Now notice, this is, this is her husband, but she, she's saying this because she's saying, look, I'm not defending him because he's right. And this is important because we're always doing the right thing, which is tree of knowledge of good and evil. We want to do the right part of that tree. We don't want to do the evil part. We're, we're all mixed up in our understanding, and it's not about the Lord except for the law or doing right or not doing wrong, which is what the law was. <clears throat> because there is, a, there is a law, a commandment that is higher than God to us. God's just the punisher. That's the high thing, that, those commandments. Um, so, but she's saying, look, she's not putting down her husband. She's saying, I'm, look, I know you know, I'm not here because of good and evil. I'm not here thinking, well, my husband's good and you're evil or any of that kind of stuff. She's explaining that I know the real issue here, but I know the real outward story, but. And so um, <clears throat> let's see. Verse 25, let not my Lord, I pray thee, regard this worthless fellow, even Nabal, for as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name, and folly is with him. But I, thine handmaiden, saw not the young men of my Lord whom thou didst send. In other words, these ten guys came to the house, and only Nabal saw them, and he talked them and sent, away, sent them away roughly. She says, I, didn't, I never knew it. Now therefore, my Lord, as the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, seeing the Lord hath withheld thee from coming to shed blood and from avenging thyself with thine own hand, now let thine enemy and they that seek evil against my Lord be his Nabal. She's talking to him as if he's king. Do you see that? She's talking to him as if he's the king. He's not being very kingly right now. But she is saying, this is who you are. And she says, folly is who he is. I mean, Nabal in Hebrew means folly. So when they walked up, they said, hey, folly. You know, <laughs> you know. That'd be, today's modern vernacular would be, say, foo. You know. <laughs> and now this blessing which thine handmaiden hath brought unto my Lord, let it even be given unto the young men who follow my Lord. I pray thee, forgive the trespass of thine handmaid, for the Lord will certainly, now get this, for the Lord will certainly make my Lord a sure house, because my Lord fighteth the battles of the Lord. He's not fighting for himself. He's not fighting for official glory. 
He fighteth the battles of the Lord, and evil hath not been found in thee all thy days. And basically, she's right. She understands the nature of or the, the, the nature of this guy, but more importantly, the nature of the kingdom that this king is going to bring. Yet a man is risen to pursue thee. He's ta she's talking about Saul now, or the king, the present king, but she's just calling him a man who has risen to pursue thee and to seek thy soul. But the soul of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of life with the Lord thy God. Hallelujah. They're one. They're one. They're wrapped up in oneness. And the souls of thine enemy, them shall he sling out as out of the middle of a sling. <clears throat> Let's read a little further. And it shall come to pass when the Lord shall have done for my Lord according to all the good that he had spoken concerning me and shall have appointed thee ruler over Israel. So basically what she's saying is, look, you're, you're king. Not just because of the anointing, but because of the way that you've carried yourself. So you will surely come to this official glory, but that official glory is only based on the glory of nature that you have carried yourself in. This is Philippians 2. This is, you know, wherefore thou hast highly exalted him and given him a name. What, what is the wherefore relating to? He humbled himself. He became a man. He became obedient. He, that obedience went all the way unto death, even the death of the cross. He laid down his life for the ungodly. He laid down his life for the ones that were undeserving. Wherefore, God exalts that. God will, you know. And then he'll do the good that he has spoken concerning thee and shall have appointed thee ruler over Israel. Verse 31 that this shall be no grief, that this present situation shall be no grief unto thee, nor offense of heart unto my Lord, either that thou hast shed blood without cause, or that my Lord hath avenged himself. But when the Lord shall have dealt well with my Lord, then remember thine handmaiden. So, in this moment, at this time, First, as you went with the Lord, you rose up and up, and then there was singing and the joy in the background. <clears throat> the, um, at this time, she's functioning as his conscience, or deeper than that, his spirit, the spirit of a king. She, you know, I mean, David was corrected so much by the Lord. But it's nice to have somebody that comprehends the true way and realizes you are at a crossroads here, buddy boy. You need to go with the Lord. And so let me just say, you know, whether you're a king or a husband or whatever, we, you know, there are times we need to listen to somebody that is, they may be considered in the chain of command under or whatever, but they are speaking from the Lord to keep us safe, to keep us right in the Lord with these things. <clears throat> then remember thine handmaid. Verse 32, And David said to Abigail, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel. <laughs> he heard what he's been living. He heard out of the mouth of someone else what he's been living. And his own men hadn't been getting it. So the first words out of his mouth when he hears that is, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel. <laughs> Not only that, but, the, but who sent thee this day to meet me, because I would have done this and I would have defiled my kingdom. I would have gone against the very thing I stand for. And blessed be thy advice. And blessed be thou. Boy, he is just full of blessings. I mean, he just full of blessings now because he comprehends what this has meant and not just not just this present thing but the ramification the wave the throwing the rock in the pond and all the waves that it's going to bring in the future and she addressed that and said you don't want this you don't want all that's going to come from this not you because you have kept your <laughs> that's how she's talking to him in honor and everything else just like the lamb himself 
<clears throat> and blessed be thy advice, and blessed be thou who hast kept me this day from coming to shed blood and from avenging myself with mine own hand. For in very deed, as the Lord God of Israel liveth, who hath kept me back from hurting thee, except thou hast hastened and come to meet me, surely there had not been left unto Nabal by the morning light any male child. So David received of her hand that which she had brought him, and said to her, Go up in peace to thine house. See, I have hearkened to thy voice, I, and have accepted thy person. That's so significant. She didn't just bring good advice. It was her person. It was who she was that affected David. It was her person. I have received your advice, but I've done more than receive. I have accepted your person. This lamb, this kingly. Here it is, a woman bearing herself as a king. Bearing herself shall I say it more clear, in the kingdom of God, bearing herself in the glory of nature that he loves. He loves it. So when he sees it in someone else and it corrects him from the outside, it's actually not shameful. It's a glory. It's like, oh, glory to God. You could just scream for joy. And accepted thy person. <clears throat> Um, let's see, where, where am I at? And verse 36, and we'll just read um, a couple more here. And Abigail came to Nabal, and behold, he held a feast in his house like the feast of a king. <laughs> okay, yes, but what kind of kingdom? Official glory manner. I mean, it's one thing to resist the true king, folks. It's another thing to set yourself up as king. Do you understand the difference? You know, I, you can oppose somebody, and I, I don't even suggest that just because of things that I know, but I mean, you can oppose somebody, but I got news for you. Don't put someone else down and say, you're it. And so... Um, verse 36 again and Abigail came to Na Nabal and behold he held a feast in his house like the feast of a king and Nabal's heart was merry within him for he was very drunk okay his heart was merry you know have you ever heard the scripture says a merry heart doeth good like a medicine this isn't the medicinal thing you should be taking it's, it's the Lord Wherefore, she told him nothing, less or more, until the morning light. Why? Well, he's drunk and he's a king. I mean, it's one thing to approach the king, but when he's drunk, it's worse. And it came to pass in the morning when the wine was gone out of Nabal, and his wife had told him these things, that his heart died within him, and he became as a stone. All right. So what did he do? God struck him. No. He manifested what he was. His heart was dead within him and he was like a stone. He just manifested what he was. We always see stuff like that and we go, oh, I wouldn't want the... The Lord way up there is not going to smite you and turn you into something that you're not. <laughs> he will simply manifest what you are. Now, if that don't put the fear of God in you, I don't know what does, but... <clears throat> All right, so <clears throat> I'll just read a little bit here. David asked for bread without shame, knowing who he really was as a true king. When she brought it, he received the homage due without rejection. But when he did not make himself of no reputation, that's where the real danger came. Because... And David does after this so many times. If they, if they give him official glory, he walks in it. But if, if they give it to him and then all of a sudden take it away, he drops. 
<coughs> back down because in truth, <coughs> excuse me, in truth, even when he's walking in the official glory that they give him, he's not walking in it. He's walking in the glory of nature. So he never dro drops, <coughs> excuse me, he never drops down because that's where he always is. He's always the Lamb of God. <coughs> yes? <coughs> or of God. But it is outward recognition. And remember, Jesus laid all of that aside. Right? <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> um, when, con when confronted with the truth of his coming kingdom by Abigail, David knows how to take the proper place. Does that make sense? <clears throat> he knows how to take the proper place. Just remember, Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. <clears throat> it is in this world, but it's not of this world. I mean, that's the difference, you know. I mean, he, he could say, my kingdom is not of this world. And we say, well, it's not in this world. Yeah, it was. Jesus walked around saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Right? But it's not of this world. It's of, as its source, God's nature. Not just God, not just heaven. God's nature. Is that the government that governs you? Is that the government of the kingdom within you? Is that your kingdom? And how would you know it's your kingdom? By replacing the word kingdom with the word government and asking yourself, what am I governed by? Okay? Um, I've said this many times over the years. People say, well, where is the kingdom of God? And I say, anywhere Christ rules. By his nature, not sitting on the throne saying, do this and that. Anywhere that he rules, there's the kingdom of God. <clears throat> All right. So now, let me read a little comparison here that I wrote, just a small paragraph on comparing Jesus, David, Jesus and David's kingdom. One thing you have to remember, and, and this is important, is God did not honor Saul's kingdom. The people wanted a king. The people wanted a king. The person wasn't the one God said, that's my man. The person, Saul, had a lot of good qualities when they first, I mean, he was, he was, he was humble when they came to pick him out, he was hiding, and I mean, there was honestly a lot of good things. <clears throat> but what did God say, when thou wast little in thine own eyes, you were everything I wanted, but now look at you. <clears throat> he began to do this and that, and take advantage of this, and work this for his own personal thing and all this kind of stuff. <clears throat> God said, that's not, that's not my kingdom. Why? Because that's not my king. That's you. Where's David in you? You understand what I'm saying? Where's Christ in you? Where's my king? You know, I know this is not my kingdom because it's coming out of you. It's your way that you're governed. Where's my king? Because I know how he'll be governing inside of you. He'll, he'll govern, your mo govern your motives and govern your attitudes and govern your reactions and govern, you know, where. And that's what the Father says to me moment by moment. Where's my king? And I want to be able to say, here is your king. Jesus carried himself in the same manner, speaking of David. Like David, Jesus was a rejected king, but still met the need without reproach based on them opening the door for the glory of nature, meaning 
If somebody opened the door for him to, to bless, to serve, to heal, to do whatever, it was his nature to give. It was his, you know, have mercy on me, thou son of David. Have mercy. That's not, those are the only words that were used over and over. Have mercy because apparently David was this same way. And like I said, this foreigner, this blind man, they didn't have all the information that all the regular Jews had. But they had heard something about this one-time king a long time ago that he was selfless and, and gave glory to God and didn't seek for official glory but actually took care of people less than himself, if you will. And he, of course, he didn't think that, but, you know. <clears throat> and when the blind man heard with Jesus of Nazareth, he, something in him rang clear, and he said, you know, Jesus, thou son of David. And the second time, he just left off the Jesus and said, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Only a son of David, you understand what I'm saying? When I, only a son of David would have had mercy. Anyone else would have gone with the advice of their disciples of the top guy that says, Shut up, leave him alone. This is somebody great coming through your city. Don't bother him. You're just a blind beggar. And he says, he, he says, this is the kingdom. I'm not looking to go do a, a kingdom thing. This is the kingdom. And they didn't get it. The 12 didn't get it. Peter eventually got it. I really believe Peter eventually got it. But he had to go through the ringer. But it was good for him, ultimately. It was good for him. All right, so um, the first half, Jesus walked as a man and sought no official glory. But in resurrection, God gave him the highest official glory. Now, isn't that true? And in David's resurrection... He was brought into Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem, they honored him as king, and they blessed him, and they <clears throat> so many things happened from people honoring him. But the moment some situation arose that would not honor him with official glory, he would immediately take the lower seat, or what we would call the lower seat. I, I believe, again, that that was where he lived. Because he knew that God is getting glory now more than he was me sitting on a big throne with everybody scraping and bowing. Now, every Christian I know that, you know, I mean, outside of, <clears throat> but most of the people that I know just out there in the modern day church, they are trying to gain as much official glory as they can so they can give glory to Jesus. totally given to that, believing that their glory is what gives him glory and that he does, he's not as glorified or as great if they're not great. Does that sound weird to anybody? <clears throat> David didn't believe like that, nor the son of David. Now, can I even say it like this? Nor the sons of David. Nor the sons of David. So well, many of his sons didn't have that spirit, but there were others who did. There were others who did. <clears throat> and so, you know, David was a rejected king, but he was king, but he was rejected. Jesus walked this earth, he's a rejected king. He's king, but he's rejected from any, from almost any true official glory. We'll call you a prophet. We'll do, we'll say this, we'll, but all of the glory came from his glory of nature where he would just bless them or just give. And again, we haven't got to that class yet, but we'll talk about these miracles and healings and stuff. And from whence they came instead of how we've been taught and where they come from. <clears throat> 
So the first half he walked as a man and sought no official glory, but in resurrection God gave him the highest official glory. As such, he is the son of David, or the true seed of what David was. The true seed of what David was. All right, <clears throat> let's go look at some scriptures in the New Testament. Let's go to the Gospel of John, chapter 12. <clears throat> John, yeah, or Juan, if that, yeah. <clears throat> John chapter 12 and verse um, 20. <clears throat> and there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. The same came therefore to Philip, who was of Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. Philip cometh and telleth Andrew, and Andrew and Philip tell Jesus. And Jesus answered them. This is his answer. The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. <laughs> verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. <laughs> Do you get it? <laughs> Just great stuff. Here, these Greeks came to give official glory. <clears throat> they came to give official glory. And so they're saying, they're, we want to see Jesus, and we want to honor Jesus. And, and, and let me tell you, this is huge. These weren't Jews. These were Gentiles who came up at the feast. That means the whole world is getting a hold of this, baby. We're on the verge of stardom. And they come and they say, we want to see. And it says, and they desired him, saying, we, sir, we would see Jesus. It says Jesus answered. <laughs> Jesus, here's Jesus' answer about this glory. Because he's not answering their question because they didn't say, you think we'll be able to see Jesus? And Jesus answered. Are you following me? You, if someone asks a question, then you answer them, particularly in that way. But Jesus was answering their quest for official glory to give him official glory and Jesus is saying the hour is come that the son of man should be glorified now if Jesus stopped right there the disciples you got them right around and you got Andrew and Philip and all these guys and and uh, they're standing there and they would go that's right that's right the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Not only do we have Jews following, now we got Gentiles. He's going to get all this official glory. This is it. The hour has come. But Jesus didn't stop there. He didn't give them the opportunity to rant and rave like we do. He, stopped, he kept going, and he said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except the seed fall into the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it dies, it'll bring forth much fruit. Here he is. He's being approached on the basis of official glory. Everything within us, on, on that which is human, wants to respond to that and say, my time has come. The hour has come. And then go off on the bandwagon of official glory. Everything says, all of my suffering is about to pay off. You know. My ship is coming in. You know. I remember somebody once said to me, Brother Randy, when is my ship going to come in? I said, when did you send one out? <laughs> no, you know, we're waiting for something to come in we never sent out. 
But, but here Jesus is saying, this isn't it. This is not the arrival of what I'm about. And in fact, I'm turning this scene, I'm turning this whole scene that is all based on official glory, and I'm moving, I'm, I'm like an icebreaker, parting this, all of this to the side, and I'm bringing forth the glory of nature. Because if I don't, I'll be the only one who has this official glory? No, I'll be the only one who has this nature. <laughs> Unless I, you know, well, what's, what Jesus didn't finish with that. He went on and says, he that loveth his life shall lose it. If you pursue official glory, you'll lose it. That's what he's saying because that's the context here. If you pursue official glory, you're going to lose it. But if you give it up, if you, you know, he, let this mind be in you. Who didn't think it was something to be grasped after to have the glory that God has outwardly but made himself of no reputation with no outward glory. Humbled himself, became as a man, became as a servant. It was a man, then he made himself a servant. Then he got lower and became obedient, and then he got lower in obedience and became obedient unto death. And no mention of salvation or a great work for others is there, is mentioned there. Just the fact that that's what he did. Wherefore, God hath highly exalted. Wherefore. You ever seen that word? When you see the word wherefore, you should ask what it's there for. Why is it there? What is it saying? What is it speaking? What is it? Wherefore. This this wherefore is happening because this came first. The light came on because I flipped the switch. We just want the light to come on. There's a switch. You ha you, this is not going to happen unless that happens. God gives official glory to people who can handle it. Because they're going to stay in the glory of nature. They're not, their pride's not going to be puffed up. They're not going to think themselves something. They're not going to say, I'm better than that person. They will even humble themselves and, and deal with blind Bartimaeus. Stop his whole procession because it said a great multitude was passing by this way. Come on, this looks like the procession of a king coming through this little town. And everybody's excited. And everybody, you know, oh, and we've got, what is going on, blind Barnabas says. And he says, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And he said, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Those kind of people understand and cry out for the son of David, not the son of Saul. We've got too many sons of Saul. Got too many King Saul sitting on the throne that shouldn't be in that position, and too few sons of David. <clears throat> so the Greeks came to give official glory as Messiah, but Jesus turned the focus to self giving. And okay, over in Luke 17, I'm going to try to do a couple of quick scriptures and then end up here because. I've got a natural ending place after these couple of scriptures. Luke 17. <clears throat> Wouldn't you know it? Gosh, this is all, all about this. Uh, let's look in verse 20. And when he was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation. Neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. The 
The Pharisees are looking for something. They're looking for a day. They're caught up in the linear time measurement of life, days, weeks, months, new moons, Sabbaths, and all those in the sense of all of the rituals and all of the things pertaining to their life. Draw your lifeline along here and mark it with certain things and certain events. And so they're looking for the kingdom of God to come. And they want to know when it's going to come. And Jesus is standing right there. If there's anybody governed by the kingdom of God or by the nature of God, he's governed by. And they're asking him. And Jesus' response says, the kingdom of God cometh not with observation. It's It's not going to be a day and a time and an event. It's something that's either in you or it's not in you. In fact, let me just see what I wrote here. But Jesus turned the focus to another kingdom. It was a present kingdom that was to be founded within. This kingdom related to the glory of nature. Now, consider the kingdom of God as most people understand it. And as they study it, they're looking for a day of official glory. Jesus will get his official glory. We'll get our official glory. They will not get any official glory. Everybody that was mean to us, they will get lack of glory. And we'll be seen as we were the smart people. And y'all were the dummies. Does that really sound like what the Lord's working toward, you know? <laughs> you know, we're, we're all just like, I'm glad they're hurting. We're blessed now, and I'm just glad I'm walking around in all of this glory and honor. Jesus says, there's another kingdom that I'm talking about. It's another kingdom. It's a present kingdom has to do with being founded within you. It's a completely different kind of kingdom that you're asking about. All right. Well, you know what I wanted to do, this whole chapter is just full of this. Uh, uh, look at verse 1. Then said he unto the disciples, it is impossible but that offensive should come, but woe unto him through whom they come. In other words, there's going to be problems, but woe unto you if you're the one who's bringing up all these offenses and, do, and stirring up all this stuff. It is better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he cast into the sea than he should offend one of these little ones. In other words, this is not about doing great and mighty things for the kingdom of God. It's about not offending and walking over people. Take heed to yourself. If thy thy brother trespass against him, rebuke him. Okay, good. And if he repent, forgive. And if, he, if the tres, and if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. All right. So what is that saying? Well, I don't think he was sincere when he repented because he turned around and did the same thing. Well, you're supposed to turn around and do the same thing too. You're supposed to forgive. His part is, apparently his part is to offend and your part is to forgive. Is it not basically saying that? That it's not about having everything fixed and straight and everything like that. It's about being right in your, in your being. And then look at this. Uh, the next one is verse 7. Which of you having a servant plowing the cattle will say unto him when he has come, go and, okay, we, we dealt with that one. Then the other one is the ten lepers being cleansed, and we dealt with that one. And then it comes to the kingdom being present within you, another kingdom. Isn't that interesting that all of those scriptures and verses that we've already dealt with in prior classes are all right here in one chapter leading right up to Jesus explaining to the Pharisees who are demanding when the event of the great glory of the day of the kingdom is going to come. And Jesus is saying there's another kingdom. It's present right now and it's supposed to be founded within you. 
And he left it at that. Now look in Acts 1 because the disciples also, that was the Pharisees asking him about it. The disciples also get caught in this. Acts chapter 1. The bad thing is, is I didn't mark this verse down either. I didn't the last one either, but I found it real quick. Um, there it is, verse 6. <coughs> when they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? And he saith unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but you shall receive power, after the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be martyrs unto me. That word witnesses is not tell, telling people about Jesus. Look it up. Don't trust what I'm telling you. Look it up. It's the same exact word for martyrs. And, and you know, well, you're twisting the scriptures. No. No. That's what it means. And ye shall be martyrs unto me, both in Jerusalem and all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. So here they are. They can tell something has happened. Jesus has died. He rose again. This must be be the moment of official glory. Am I right or wrong? I mean, shouldn't this be the moment of official glory? My God, he died, he rose again. The glory is done. The, you know, the old man is dead. The, the Jewish thing is put away. There's nothing but the truth as it is in Jesus. Let's get on with it. When is this kingdom going to appear? Well, Jesus, when he spoke of the Holy Spirit coming, he didn't say you're going to talk in tongues. He didn't talk about a bunch of the things that we talk about. When we name the Holy Spirit, we start writing all these things. He said he's going to reveal me in you. He's going to reveal me in you. And that's going to be the kingdom. And wherever you go, whether Samaria or Judea or whatever, you will live according to this nature. Not just you'll tell a few people about Jesus. You'll live according to my nature. You will be the sons of God. You won't be the tellers of the truth. Witnesses. You will be the sons of God. And so, well, let me read this, and then I'll, I'll end. This will be a good spot here. In Acts 1, the disciples ask as to when the kingdom would appear. Again, Jesus points to another kingdom wherein they would be witnesses, martyrs, who would live and give testimony to the government that must first appear. In all cases, the glory that comes from the government of Christ within must be established first. David, that's what happened with his life. What had to be established first was the government of nature. Then God would give official glory. With Jesus, with David, he was a rejected king. Then God honored him. And only among those who honored that, that lamb, that king. Okay. Jesus, rejected king. Then he came to his glory. So Jesus, that same one, says, now I'm going to go away and I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit and he's going to work things on the inside of you. He's going to work a kingdom on the inside of you. And you'll be, we say, well, you'll be a witness of the kingdom. You'll be a martyr of the kingdom. You'll be an example. Do you understand? You'll be an example of the kingdom. Um, 
Again, Jesus points to another kingdom wherein they would be witnesses, martyrs, who would live and give testimony to the government that must first appear. In all cases, the glory that comes from the government of Christ within must be established first. There will be no royal glory until we appear as kings. It doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he appears, that's what we're going to be like. That's what's going on during this time period. Does this seem like the time of great official glory? No, of course not. <laughs> then what is it? It is the time where the kingdom gets worked on the inside so that we live according it, so that when he does set up a glorious kingdom, it won't affect us, it won't, you know. You shall be rulers over ten kingdoms. You don't go, you know, and then he says to the one guy, and you'll only be ruler over one, and you go, I'm better than you. You think that's going to happen? I don't think so. That's why Jesus died to crucify that kind of stuff. He's not going to let that rule, if you understand what I'm saying. Father, we just ask you to continue to speak by the Holy Spirit and not, and not just another sermon or another class. Father, to determine your voice. And only by your voice will we change, will we be drawn, will we recognize what's higher will we recognize first things first first kingdoms first first realities first and we will not put the cart before the horse and we will not seek what we'll never have because if we seek it we lose but if we lose for your sake we gain we will comp contemplate long and much so that we may eventually comprehend. And our contemplations, our meditations will be of you. May the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart be acceptable in your sight. Oh, Lord, our strength and our redeemer, in Jesus' name, amen. We're dismissed.